I am a married mother of two. Um, I've been with my husband, Leif, for 23 years. I have a 19-year-old son, Eric, and a 13-year-old daughter, Riley. And um, I have to confess, I used to have an irrational fear of old people. So I'm sorry about that in advance. I, I don't know what it was. I just, my growing up and when I had children, we would go to Boy Scout things, Girl Scout things at the different um, senior centers and I don't know what it was. It was just, but now that I'm getting close to old people age, I'm learning to love you all. So with that being said, um, I'm gonna talk about today just basically my life, um, I'm not an expert, I'm not, I don't write books. I actually, this is my first speaking engagement ever on this topic. Um, so thank you for letting me come and speak to you guys. Um, I'm just a normal wife and mother that is a little different. And I found out that I was different, and actually I didn't know I was different. About when I was five years old, I realized that I had an imaginary friend. That's what my mom called him. He lived in our house. He moved my toys. Um, I spoke to him. I didn't see him, but I could feel him. I knew it was a man. I knew his name was William, and I knew he was old. He was 50. That's not old, because I'll be 50 this year. <laughs> but when you're five, 50 is old. And he was just this guy that would be at my house and play with me. Uh, my sister came along right around when I was four and a half. And so right after she came in, William, I started experiencing William in my house. And so my mom would say, oh, you know, your imaginary friend, how's he today? Oh, fine. Never once did he, she say anything about ghosts or anything like that. And then as I grew up and got older and I would, you know, walk to and from school, there was another guy, uh, another guy that would walk home with me. And at one point during our walk home, he'd walk into the street and disappear. And I thought, oh, another imaginary friend, sweet. So I would talk to my mom about that imaginary friend. And then as I got older and I realized that imaginary meant not real, but what these people were in my life were real because they were moving my things. I was able to talk to them. I was able to not necessarily see them, but I could, it's so hard to explain, picture them in my head about what they were and what they looked like. My sister and I, when she got older, we would put all our doll clothes in the middle of our room and then go um, off to the bathroom and we'd count. We'd come back, all our doll clothes were gone, we'd have to find them. That was what William did. William did things like that all the time. So my sister and I had a lot of the same experiences growing up. And so as I realized imaginary went not real, and these were very real, I was like, well, what, what are these? These are people. And I figured out that they were ghosts or spirits. And I, none of my friends talked about ghosts. When I was in middle school, I said something to one of my friends and she was like, well, ghosts aren't real. And I'm like, yes, they are. <laughs> my mom never told me they weren't real. Um, and I actually never talked to her until I was much older about William that was in our house. She just thought I always had imaginary friends. So it was, it's just very interesting how I was never told ghosts aren't real. And I continue to use what I call my psychic muscle, my sixth sense, um, so to say, throughout my whole entire life because I was never told that ghosts weren't real. And I feel like a lot of kids today, a lot of parents tell, tell kids ghosts aren't real to not, so they're not scared, but so that they don't use that muscle. I believe every child that is born has an ability. And they, it, whether they use that ability or not is whether they lose it or keep it. So that's just my personal feelings on that stuff. Um, I always felt different, and I'm even different now. Like as a mom, I'm not just a mom and a wife. 
I actually am a competitive tap dancer. <laughs> I've tap danced since I was four years old. Um, I am a competitive speed jigsaw puzzler. That is a thing. And we just had our national jigsaw puzzle championships in March in San Diego. And my partner and I placed 44th out of 200. So I think that was pretty good. Um, and I, I like to do different things. And when you're in Orange County, <laughs> as someone who is into the paranormal, it's very intimidating because when you're in Orange County, there's a lot of OC housewives that you have to look a certain way, be a certain way, do, a cer do certain things, and I am definitely not that. So I do not fit in that mold <laughs> at all. Um, some of the things I wanna talk about is um, when I was young, I, these, these people would come to me and sometimes I got really overwhelmed with the different people that were coming to me that I couldn't see, but I could feel them. And so what I did was I created this thing called my shield. And the way that I did it was I stood there and maybe I could go to the side, or maybe I could go to the side. Anyway, and I would take my hands and I would go, and create this entire bubble around my body. And that bubble made those people stop talking to me. Um, I believe that, of course, that was my intention to have them stop talking to me. So whether I had the shield or not, that was my, my actual thing to make them stop talking to me. Because as a child and as, growing, as I was growing up, they got very overwhelming. The the people that were coming towards me because I feel like what I am is I'm a flashlight in a dark room. And those spirits go, oh, that one, that one can see me, that one can feel me, I'm gonna go over there. And sometimes I don't wanna see them, I don't wanna feel them, I don't wanna talk to them. When I'm on my investigations, which I'll talk about in a little bit, I take down my shield or I put it up depending on what I feel. Um, so anyways, that's my, my shield. Um, growing up and, well, actually I shouldn't say growing up. When I got older um, and I met my husband, Leif, in 1995, Leif's mom got cancer. And she had, she had it for about two years. Um, and then she had passed away on one night. Um, it was very sad, Leif was sad. And then a couple days after she passed away, I got a phone call. I was home by myself. I picked up the phone and I said, hello. And I stood there and I felt, her name was Lori, I felt Lori. And I went, Lori, and there was this crackly sound. And then they hung up. I was like, whoa. I, and Leif came home from work. I'm like, I think your mom just called me on the phone. He's like, what? No, because my husband, which I'll tell you in a little bit, is, was a skeptic. Um, and I was like, no, 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 I swear this happened. So a couple days later, I got another phone call. I was home by myself. I answered the phone. Nobody was there. I, heard, I felt her. I said, Lori. I heard the crackle. She hung up. The third time that it happened, Leaf was at home. And the phone rang. I answered the phone. I said, hello. No one was there. I went like this to my husband who was across the room. I'm like, it's your mom. I said, and I said to her, I said, Lori, we're gonna be okay. I heard the crackle, she hung up the phone, and I didn't hear from her again. I feel like, because Leif, Leif had had a very tumultuous relationship with his mother, and right near the end, they got back in good graces, I guess you could say. And when his mom passed away, he was so sad. And so I think that she was just calling to check up on him. And so that was one of my experience with Leaf. Now at that time, Leaf was like, well, I don't know. He was still very skeptical. Um, when we first started dating, funny story, um, I didn't know how to tell him that I could, I had this ability. And we were, it, we were camping, we were in, does, any, does everybody know Bodie in California, Bodie Ghost Town? Okay. So every year we would go camping with my family down in Twin Lakes, and one of those days we'd go to the ghost town. And I love the ghost town because I can feel a lot of people and feel a lot of things. 
And we'd go there and I was like, okay, I think this is the place. I like this guy, but this is like the, he's going to either be okay with me or leave me. <laughs> so I told him, I said, I can feel spirits. And he's like, what? I'm like, I feel spirits. I promise you here. This is how I feel. To me, a spirit feels like a person. So I don't know if any of you have ever shared a room with your sister or your brother, and at night it's dark, but you can still feel that there's another person in the room. That's what a spirit feels like to me, that there's another person standing by me or in a room. Um, and so I told him that. I said, that's what it feels like to me. And when I feel those things, I can usually feel male or female energy. I can feel young or old energy, and I can feel usually good or bad energy. And he was like, mm. so the whole time that we were at Bodhi, I shouldn't have told him at that time, but I did. We'd walk to a building and he'd go, what do you feel? I'm like, oh, tell him what I feel. Walk to another building, what do you feel? I'm like, stop, I feel spirits, this is what I feel. So the whole time, every single building that we went to, he was like, what do you feel? What do you feel? And I'm like, okay, this was a mistake to tell him here. But he stayed with me. He was like, well, you're weird. That's okay. Everybody's weird. Whether he believes it or not, he knew that I believed it, and that was okay with him. So that, that, was, uh, um, that was Leaf's first encounter with me and my, and my paranormal stuff. Um, my very first apparition that I ever saw. Now I don't, I'm what's called clairsentient, which means that I can sense the spirits. There's clairvoyant where you can see them, and there's clairaudient, clairaudient, I think, where you can hear them. I sense them, but I have seen a few full-bodied apparition. The very first one I saw, I was about eight years old. My Aunt Joan lived in Glendale. She lived in an old a house that used to be um, like a train stop. There was a train that went through there and it was where people would get off the train, sleep there, and then go on the train and keep going. And the, her house was cool. It was really cool, um, just different. And they had this back, like this back room and this giant chalkboard, I was writing on the chalkboard and all of a sudden my arms got prickly, the hair started standing up on the back of my neck and I was like, what is that? I turn around and what I see, the only way I can describe it is if you put water in your mouth and you go and you spray it like a spray out of your mouth, it was this spray of water in a, the form of a person walking. And I watched it. I watched it. And it went into this little side room that they had down there in their back room. And I went, whoa. Because still at that time, I was still trying to, I was eight. I was still trying to figure out, okay, imaginary friend, ghosts, things are real, things are not real. I didn't say anything to anybody because I didn't want anybody to think I was crazy because at that point, I still was like, mm, I'm not sure about this. That was my very first apparition that I ever saw. Later on in life, when I talked to my Aunt Joan, I, said, I told her about this and she goes, oh yeah, that, my house was haunted. We had several spirits. That was just the guy and whatever she said. And I was like, what? So it was kind of cool to like, but when, I, when you're eight, you don't want to be like, hey, I saw a ghost or whatever. Um, so that's my first apparition. The other cool thing that I feel and have felt is when I was pregnant. Um, I don't, when I was pregnant, I could feel different spirits deciding if they wanted to be in this body that was in my stomach or not. I, so the way that I believe is that I believe in reincarnation. I believe that you come back and you keep coming back until you're finished with what you are supposed to be doing. And then you go on to heaven or whatever you want to call it, you move on. So what I felt when my first, my son, I felt two different spirits around me all the time, all the time. And at first I was like, well, this is weird. I don't want them hanging out, whatever. And then at one point I only felt one. And, I, and that's when I could feel him as Eric. 
So when, when I was first pregnant, it just felt like I was pregnant, I was sick, all this stuff. And then he got a personality just overnight. It was the weirdest thing. And I, I could feel that there, the, the whatever person decided to inhabit my son, who's now my son, and it was the coolest thing ever. So I thought, well, let me see if this happens when I get pregnant with my daughter. And it did. Three, actually, three spirits were trying to become what is Riley today. And one of them, I don't know how they chose, but one of them went out and we have Riley and she's awesome. Both my kids are awesome. And so I've never had anybody else that I know of talk to me about this. Um, because again, it's weird. People, if you talk to people about this and they're like, that's so, that's weird, or they don't agree, or they don't believe that. So it's just not something that I talk about. But I truly believe that, you know, those spirits are fighting for that little body that's in there and who's going to win and who's going to not. So I feel that my children chose me. Um, and so that's kind of, I feel real special about that part. Um, okay. Now, I don't know, <clears throat> I know I'm talking about ghosts. I have had alien encounters. I don't know if you guys talk about aliens, but I have had a couple of those. So if you want to hear about that stuff, we can talk about that later, or if you can ask questions or whatever. Um, okay, so when I, getting into the paranormal, uh, up until, I don't know, Eric, what, Eric's 19 now, so up until he was about a year old, um, I, I had this ghost thing going on. I would shield them, all this stuff. And then the show Ghost Hunters came on TV. And I watched it. And I was like, oh, I want to do that. That looks awesome. And so I, I would, back then, I would, I don't know if it was Google. Maybe it was Ask Jeeves. I think it was Ask Jeeves back then. I would ask Jeeves, like, paranormal investigation groups. And I would, like, email everybody I could find and phone call. And everybody wanted people with experience. And I was like, well, my whole life I've had experience. Well, no, you, you, you've never investigated. I'm like, well, how do I get experience if you don't bring me on and teach me how to do this stuff? Finally, one group called the Southern California Society for Paranormal Research, or SCSPR, said, yes, why don't you come on? Come We'll interview you on a um, investigation and see if you have what it takes. The guy's name was Lewis. He ran the group and he said, bring your husband so you don't feel uncomfortable. I said, great, because I didn't want to feel uncomfortable either. So I went, we did it on the Queen Mary. It was the coolest thing I've ever done ever. And it was actually on my birthday. So it was actually the day before my birthday. So the clock clicked over into midnight. We were down in the very bottom parts of the, the Queen Mary. And I looked at the clock and I said, it's my birthday. And everybody said, happy birthday. It was the coolest birthday ever. Um, but that's how he loved me. That's how I got into the paranormal. But what I realized was, is as we were doing these different investigations, there were, I was the only girl on the team. There was guys, they were not married, and they would call me up and be like, we're going to Arizona tomorrow. And I'm like, <laughs> I can't go to Arizona tomorrow. I have a son, I have a wife, I have a job. <laughs> I can't just drop everything and go. So after a while, they started not inviting me to stuff because they thought, oh, she can't go. So she's, you know, we're just not going to invite her. The ones that I was able to go to was the ones I set up. And I thought, this is, this is not good. I want to go to all these things. So back then, this was in 2010, um, a lot of people had, a lot of paranormal people had their birthday parties on the Queen Mary because Queen Mary is really haunted. So it is 100% haunted. Um, so everybody had their birthday parties there. We'd walk around the ship. We'd, you know, do little investigations. And I was sitting at a table with three women and their husbands. And we talked about, all of us were on different teams. All of us, sorry gentlemen, were run by men. And all of us were having problems with this whole scheduling thing because we all had kids, we all had husbands. And so we said, we should investigate together. <clears throat> and one of the girls, her name is Kirsten, she said, we should form our own team. 
the Paranormal Housewives. I'm like, that's awesome. Everybody was like, that's cool. So we formed the Paranormal Housewives uh, in May, the end of May 2010. We did our first investigation in June. Soon after that, we all three got kicked off of our other teams because in the paranormal, there's a lot of egos with, sorry men, with the men. They like to talk about who they know, who they've investigated with, what they've done, and they like to, you know, puff up their feathers and this is how awesome I am. And us girls were like, we just want to investigate. So we all got kicked off our teams and that was it. We were the paranormal housewives and there was three of us, Marsha, Kirsten, and myself at the beginning. And so that whole thing started. And then what we would do is we would have, we'd get together and we'd calendars. Everybody bring your calendar. We'd calendar dates. Okay, we're going to do this and this and this and this. We'd have calendar dates. We didn't have a leader of our group. Everybody was a leader. So if you said, oh, I'm going to take the July investigation, it was your, you were the leader of the investigation. You found the place. Um, you did all that. And then as we started to become more, I guess, popular, pe our name started to get out there, people started contacting us. Hey, we have this problem in our house. Can you please come and see what it is? And we're like, okay, okay, this is, we're kind of, you know, feeling more, um, not just a fun group, but we're actually like helping people, which one of our goals as Paranormal Housewives is to help people, um, which... Uh, is different than the other groups, the other group that I was in. They wanted to just be like, have the best, like, here's my evidence. This is what I got. This is better than your, your evidence type thing. And I, we didn't want that. We wanted to help people because spirits are here, whether you like it or not. And it's how we interact and how we deal with them. And that's what we wanted to help empower the homeowners that we were going in to help um, empower them to not feel scared or lost or didn't know what to do. Um, okay, I'm looking at my notes. My notes, by the way, is on the same paper as my Costco thing. I'm not, I'm not I'm telling you I'm not a speaker, but. <laughs> um, one of the other things is our color is pink. This is what I normally wear in an investigation. My, our pink shirts, they say Paranormal Housewives on them. You can see them closer. I wear my pink Hello Kitty uh, Converse and jeans. Everybody wears, we have different colored, or different colors of pink shirts. Uh, we don't wear black, because all paranormal groups wear black, and we are different. And so we wear pink, which is kind of cool. Um, okay, let's see. So our, and our goals as Paranormal Housewives has changed. At the beginning, my goal, actually everybody has their different goals, but my goal at the very beginning was to make everybody believe because I knew what was happening. I could tell this is real and I wanted everybody like to, to say, you, you, this is real, here's my evidence. You, this is real, here's my evidence. The problem is we had when you listen to somebody else's evidence or you see someone else's picture, if you weren't there, it's not real to you. It's awesome and it's cool. And even if you know that person and you trust that person, you still weren't there to experience what they experienced. So my views have changed over the years from I'm trying to prove this to I'm helping people and just experiencing it myself and what else is out there, and learning about what else is out there and what other paranormal things I can continue to grow with. You know what I mean? So it's not, it's just changed. There's a couple of uh, the girls in our group, we all believe differently. Um, one of our girls, Marsha, she believes that um, we're intergalactic, which is okay. Uh, we've had some experiences where she might be onto something, I'm not sure, but she might be onto something. Uh, we have one girl who has, Kirsten, she has gone through, I think, every single religion trying to find one that she fits into. But none of them she feels she fits into any. And I, I have felt the same thing. I'm 
I'm not religious. I'm spiritual, which is different. I 100% believe in God, and I believe that all religions, most religions, are good, and they all kind of have the same message where they want to, you, you as a spirit, they want to better you as a spirit and you as a better person. So, but I, I don't, none of us really fit into one group, uh, one religion. So the three of us investigating, we decided, we met these girls on the Queen Mary one time. One of them was Kimberly. Kimberly is not married, doesn't have kids, but we really liked her and we really clicked with her. So we actually asked her to be on our team. She said yes, of course. Kimberly is our level-headed investigator. Um, Kirsten is our uh, religious investigator. Marcia is our, she actually likes the kids' spirits too, but she's more of our galactic investigator. Um, I'm the clairsentient, so I can feel things. Then we had Kimberly. Kimberly was our scientist. She was the one that was like, let's scientifically prove this. Let's science do this. We'd have recorders, we'd do all these equipment things. And at the beginning, that was great. And that's, that was her thing, that was her jam. But she's also evolved over time because she's experienced things that you can't, you can't duplicate. And so it's not something that science can prove. There is a, a quote that I wrote down, science is only good for repeatable phenomenon. The most interesting parts of life don't repeat. So there's nothing, there's no scientific proof. We can't, we can't recreate something from a spirit because spirits are people. People have free will. Everybody was born with free will. You can do whatever, you know, you want, whether you have a body or whether you don't have a body. And that's the thing. It's like you can't get someone appear, if I say spirit appear, and they appear once, spirit appear, they're not, I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. If I was that spirit, I'd be like, no, I'm not appearing again. I already did it one time. I'm not going to do it again. So our scientific Kimberly, she's still scientific, by the way. She still likes, likes equipment. She, however, has changed a little bit. And our fifth paranormal housewife is actually my best friend, Jen. I actually call her my Craigslist friend. I met her on Craigslist, <laughs> which She's gonna hate that I'm talking to you guys about this. But I was a um, preschool dance teacher. She had a little Craigslist ad. She was looking for a preschool dance teacher. I called her up and I said, you're gonna wanna hire me because I know all your dances already. She was with a company that I had learned from since I was four years old. So I already knew all their dances. She was like, really? So I came, she met me and we instantly clicked. We instantly, it's, it's weird, it was like, um, we had known each other before. And we, she says, hey, I wanna go to coffee. This is after she hired me. I had been working for her for a couple of months. She says, hey, let's go to coffee. I'm like, okay. So we sit down and she goes, okay, what do you do? What do you like to do? And I was like, well, this is always the part that I'm like, well, I don't know if I wanna tell you this, but, and I told her, I said, I'm a paranormal investigator. I hunt ghosts. She goes, what? That's the coolest thing I've ever heard ever. So after that, she was like, I want to come. And I'm like, well, let's talk to the other girls. So we talked to the other girls and they instantly clicked with her. And so she came in, she came in in, I think, 2013. We still call her, her our new person, <laughs> even though it's been almost 10 years. And um, we still haze her, even though we don't. She's like, is this hazing? Because I don't want to do this. I'm like, Jen, you're the new person. You have to do it first or whatever. But anyways, so she's still our, she's our newest member and actually our last member. So there is five of us. Um, our other, our values as paranormal investigators are different than a lot of um, other teams. Now, not a lot, other teams have our same values, but we are a strong team. We work really well together. We get really good evidence when all five of us are together. I don't know what it is, but we always get evidence. And sometimes on other teams, they don't always get evidence, but we, for some reason, always get evidence, which is great. Um, we have little to no drama. We always talk things out. There's no drama. And if you've ever known about the paranormal world in investigation teams, there's a lot of paradrama a lot of paradrama. Teams fighting, 
I mean, it's a thing. I'll tell you some if you want to hear about it. <laughs> we also don't provoke because if just think about it, if you're a spirit, you don't have a body and someone comes up into your house and says, you better show yourself right now or I'm going to, you know, whatever, get mad, yell, scream. I'll be like, what? get out of my house right now. And I would get mad. We don't want to make them mad. We just want to talk to them, find out more information about them and find out what they're doing here, what, you know, what they are, who they are, how they are, uh, how they, um, how they are attached to this property or wherever we're at at the time. So we want to talk to them like an actual person, an actual human being, have an actual regular conversation with them. So that's how our team is. There's a lot of teams that provoke and try to get them all riled up and mad so they can get evidence, but we don't do that. So that's, uh, that's what we do. And then how we investigate is also different. A lot of teams go in and they have all this equipment, cameras and REM pods and all this equipment. And you go into a room and they set it all up and then they, they say, okay, we're ready after about you know 30 minutes. We have very little equipment, which I'll show you how, what we use. And we walk into the room and we start before we have, because when you walk into a room, the energy that's in there is there. And if you move around the energy and set up all your equipment and stuff, that energy dissipates and is gone. We want to know what's in there right then at the very beginning. What do we feel? What do we see? And so we are a, we, we don't go around setting up, up equipment. The equipment that we use is what we have in our hands or what we have in our bodies, you know, camera or whatever. So that's how we are different. Parama Housewives, we've done a lot of investigating. We investigate historical places. We investigate homes. And then TV comes along. And TV, probably about, I don't know, maybe six or eight years ago, loved the paranormal. And we had a great name, the Paranormal Housewives. And so many producers contacted us. We want you to be on a TV show. We want to do a reality show for you. And we were all excited. We're like, oh my gosh, we're going to be famous. But that is not the case. Because in TV, you, they, TV is, they want you to fabricate evidence. Now, this is just what it is. Television shows are there to entertain. And so while some of it can be real, a lot of it is not real. Because if uh, you get an EVP of somebody whispering and you can't hear that on TV, they're going to recre recreate that EVP so that you can hear that on TV. Or if, it, if nothing happens on an investigation, they have to do something because they're being paid to bring entertainment to you guys. And so they have to do something. The very first season of Ghost Hunters is actually my very favorite season because sometimes they got nothing. And those are the best investigations because that's real life. Sometimes we can go and get nothing. Sometimes we can go and get a ton of, of evidence. You just never know. But because we had the Paranormal Housewives as a name, all these producers would come to us. The first producer that we actually started working with, her, his name is Herman. We love Herman. Herman would come with us on investigations. Herman tried his hardest to get us a reality TV show. We did a sizzle reel, so we had like people at my house and like, you know, spike marks on my kitchen floor about where I'm supposed to stand. But it was interesting because as we were going through this, one time I was sitting on a bed and the girls were talking and I was talking and they're filming us for the sizzle reel. The sizzle reel, by the way, is something that they take to all the different TV um, programs to say, hey, look at this, look at this. They try to sell us. That's what a sizzle reel is. One time we were in a bedroom on a bed doing an investigation and Herman throws a little plastic spider onto the bed. I scream because I don't like spiders, by the way. I'm scared of spiders, not ghost spiders. Um, I scream. Everybody laughs. In the sizzle reel, something ghostly happened and I screamed. And I'm like, mm, that's not real. So TV is not real and real 
at the same time because there are TV shows that go to places that are real. So uh, just recently, the girls and I were on Ghost Adventures. So I don't know if you watch Ghost Adventures with Zach and Aaron and the other two guys, but I can't ever remember their name because I don't watch these TV shows. Um, Ghost Adventures do provoke, which is not something that I like. When they asked us to be on the show, I was a little mm, hesitant, but I thought, okay, well, whatever, we can be on the show. It was really fun. The guys were really nice. Um, we did get an amazing EVP, um, the most amazing EVP. If you don't know what an EVP is, do you guys know what an EVP is? An EVP is an electronic voice phenomenon. So what that means is like you have a, a, a recorder. Let me see, do I have a recorder here? So this is my voice recorder. And you're recording and you're talking to nothing you hear nothing, and then when you play it back, you hear something, a voice, a sentence, uh, a somebody on the recorder. That is an electronic voice phenomenon. That's an EVP. So when we were on Ghost Adventures, we got an amazing EVP, the best EVP I've ever heard in my life. Um, I, I was thinking, okay, this is TV. How could they have rigged that? There's no way what we were doing, they could have rigged that. It was awesome. We, we, we left shooting that. We were like, this is the coolest thing ever. That's going to be awesome. The TV show came out. The EVP was different. It, they changed it. It's OK. It's TV. But we did get an EVP where they said we got an EVP. It's just it sounds different than what we had because it, it had to fit their narrative for their show. And that's OK. But we did get one. So that's the coolest part of doing a TV show is you get cool things even though it might not show up on the TV show at the end. Um, we've been on ghost stories. We did, I did a ghost story, me and Kirsten did a ghost stories episode at uh, Linda Vista Hospital, which I think is now a retirement home if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Ghostbusters, we did Con TV, which is like a little public TV show. That was fun. We were on the Ricky Lake show back when she came out again. Um, she's at the Culver Studios lot. We got to investigate the, there's what they call the White House on the property. That's actually where the um, Gone with the Wind White House is. That's the house we investigated. It was awesome because we had TV people with us. We had a sound guy, we had cameramen as we investigated so it could be on her show. And the sound guy was like, what is that sound? And we're like, well, I don't know, EVP. It was awesome because some of these guys weren't believers. Um, We've done, I, we've, I've gone to Alcatraz. So Alcatraz, I spent the night on Alcatraz. It's the coolest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Alcatraz has a program, and I don't know if they still do this, but they used to have a program. It was started with the Boy Scouts. And what happened was, is they would have the Boy Scout troop come to the island. They would do a cleanup. It was all community service. They would clean up the whole island, and then they got to spend the night and do all their Boy Scout stuff. Well, paranormal people got wind of it, and so you would apply. Paranormal people would apply, and only 20 people got chosen every year. Somebody that I know got chosen, and they said, hey, do you guys want to come? I was like, yes. So I spent the night on Alcatraz. We went over, we did our community service, we cleaned up the island, we got an extremely thorough uh, tour from our tour guide. We got to go up on top of the roof where the guys and see where the guys came out after when they tried to escape or when they did escape. Um, we went, we actually slept in D block, which is the solitary confinement. I slept there. Um, it was so cool, but it's not that haunted, which, you know, people are like, oh, so haunted. It's not that haunted. We got a couple of things, but not like you would think. You would think it would be so haunted, but it's not really that haunted. It's cool, like walking into the cell block, if you've ever been to Alcatraz, and there's that cell block. I went to the restroom, it was like three in the morning, the restroom's outside. I walked into the cell block, I was by myself, in with all the cells, and I stood there and I thought, this is the coolest thing ever, because I'm on Alcatraz in the middle of the night. No one ever gets to do this. And so that, even though it wasn't that haunted and we didn't get a lot of evidence, that was the coolest thing I've ever done, ever. We got to, we got to do go places, the public doesn't get to go. If you, don't, if you know, or if you don't know, underneath Alcatraz is where all the old military stuff is. We got to go under there, we had to wear hot, uh, hard hats. 
It was cool. So anyways, Alcatraz, awesome. And if they do a paranormal tour, I highly recommend it because it's cool. And you get to hear stuff that you normally don't get to hear. Um, okay, uh, invest, investigations. Queen Mary, super haunted. I highly recommend it. There is a group on there right now called the Grey Ghost Project. Um, I'm usually skeptical about about teams that pay, charge money because we don't charge any money for what we do. We do everything for free because we never know whether we're going to get something or not. A lot of people make cookies for us or food, which we always appreciate, but we don't charge anything. So I'm always skeptical because when you pay money for something, you're wanting something in return. And so I want to make sure that, you know, if I'm paying money for something, it's going to be, I feel like something's going to be faked so that I get some sort of uh, something back for my money. But the Grey Ghost Project on the Queen Mary is excellent. If you guys ever want to do an investigation, go to the Grey Ghost Project and do one of their paranormal tours. They're great. They actually use something called the Estes Method. And I'll tell you a little bit what the Estes Method is. There is a radio. We call it the Shack Hack because it's a, a, just a little AM FM radio that we buy at Radio Shack, except I don't think Radio Shacks are around anymore. But anyways, it's a little radio. And then there's something that you do. I didn't do it because I'm not the tech person. To the radio to where it scans the, sh the channels. And it sounds like this. And then you'll hear words that come from the different radio stations that come out once in a while. Uh, we usually use AM because AM has less talking on it. And what that we use that in, in investigations sometimes because the, we feel that um, spirits are, are um, they are energy, right? So they're electrical. They have an electrical feel to them. So if there's electrical things, batteries, um, energy type things like this radio, um, they can pull off that and manifest and say something through this radio. So sometimes we'll get words out of this radio that you wasn't supposed to be on the radio. Like I've heard bad words come out of these radios and you're not supposed to say bad words on radios. So anyways, they take this. One person has headphones on hooked up to this machine and a blindfold. So they can't hear what's going on in the room and they can't see what's going on in the room. They, the, the person that has, is basically uh, blinded, blindfolded and has, is only listen to, listening to the <laughs> will say out loud words that they hear. In the meantime, the people that are in the room, whoever's conducting the experiment will ask questions. What's your name? How old are you? You know, what's your favorite color? Whatever questions they would ask. And a lot of times, the person that's listening answers those questions. It's the coolest thing ever. I've seen it done lots of times. And the Great Ghost Project on the Queen Mary uses this method. And it's so cool how sometimes whole entire sentences come out and they answer the question from what the person that uh, just asked. So I highly recommend the Queen Mary. So anyway. And I'm not affiliated with the Grey Ghost Project, so, but they're good. Um, I ha we have investigated hum Hummingbird Ranch, which if you know where that is, that's in Simi Valley, Santa Susana area. Um, it right now is used as a wedding venue. It's beautiful. It is very haunted. Um, one of our favorite places to go is a place called Amargosa. Amargosa is in the Death Valley Junction area. Um, a lady named Marta Beckett was a ballerina. She was a ballerina in New York, and in her early 20s, they said, well, you're too old to be a ballerina, can't be a ballerina anymore. She trekked across the United States, found an old theater smack in the middle of Death Valley, bought it, and put on her one-woman ballet shows for years and years and years. I've met Marta, she's passed away now, but I've met her, she was a lovely lady. She has a hotel attached to her um, theater, and that place is definitely haunted. But the thing that we love most about Amargosa is there's a cemetery about half a mile down. We had one of our most, I, I, can't, I can't even describe it. It was one of our most awe-inspiring investigations we've ever had. We were all sitting there. 
Uh, all five? No, all, there was only four of us. I don't think Jen was able to go that time. And we had our husbands with us. And all of a sudden, we saw these white figures. And a lot of times in, in the paranormal, they're shadow figures. They're dark figures. These were white. And they were people. You could tell. There was one man that was really tall. He had a ball cap on. There was one, another, another short, big guy. Um, and in the desert... I looked across and there was hundreds of these white things. They looked like clouds almost coming towards us. All the women in our group saw them. None of the men saw them. And they would come across and it was, we were like, can you see that? One per, Kirsten was like, do you see that fat guy? And I'm like, oh my God, I see the fat guy. And Marsha was like, the guy with the hat. I'm like, I see the hat. It was, it was crazy. It did not show up on our film. It did not show up, the guys didn't see it. It did not show up on our cameras. We were trying to take pictures, none of it. It was one of the coolest things I've ever experienced ever. And what we decided to do is we went back a couple years later and tried to recreate the whole thing. And the same thing happened, but we saw different people. It was so cool. The guy with the hat didn't see the guy with the hat, but we saw other people there. We saw dresses. Uh, figures with dresses, and all the women saw them, and none of the men saw them. It was, I, I can't explain it. I called them earth angels because I don't actually know what they were. I didn't feel like they were actual human spirits, but they were, it was very calming and very peaceful. I called them earth angels. I don't know what they were, but the whole, that whole experience was cool. Um, okay, and then, <laughs> I put down here haunted bathrooms. There's a lot of haunted bathrooms in everywhere, actually. <laughs> um, anytime we go to a place, a historical place, the bathroom is always creepy and haunted. We don't actually stay in there most a lot because, you know, it's a bathroom. But anywhere we go, check the bathroom, go check the bathroom, go check the bathroom. We always go check out the bathroom. Um, okay, so my next thing is I'm going to show you some of the equipment that we use. Like I said, we're not big equipment people, um, but we do use a couple of items that we always use. Okay, so our, um, this is a voice recorder, digital recorder. Um, this is, this is my new one. She's red and pretty. I don't like the black ones. They're boring. <laughs> um, but you just, you know, it, it saves your files and then you, you put it, I put it on my computer. I listened back to my audio to see if we got any EVPs. And if we got the EVP, I cut that part out, send it to the girls, and we all talk about it and see kind of what we all hear that EVP says. So we use voice recorder all the time. We always have this. The other thing we always use is this. This is a K2 meter. Um, this basically... Um, uh, monitors the electrical energy that's in a room. So you turn it on and, oh, I need a new battery. But like if you were to go to like an outlet, this would go to red because it's got a lot of electrical energy in that area. Um, but we use this because spirits, because they're energy, uh, they come up, they can touch it, they can go by it, and this will light up with nothing around it, no no uh, other thing around it and it'll light up. When every room that we go into, as we come into the room, we have one of us, some, most of the time two or three of us, has these and we'll walk around the room and we'll say, okay, electrical outlet here. So we know that we'll get a, if we are standing close, we might get a false read by whatever electrical outlet. So we use this a lot. These are actually the two things we use. That's it. Sometimes we have little other equipment, um, video camera, you know, but I don't want to watch all the footage. That's, to me, that's boring. Uh, Kirsten's husband, Ty, he's our video guy. If he comes, he likes to do all the video stuff. So he does the video stuff. So um, when I investigate, uh, this is my fanny pack I wear. I know fanny packs aren't cool now. They're now called belt bags and people wear them across here, but no, I'm old school, so I use my fanny pack. And in my fanny pack, besides my two uh, recorder and my K2 meter, I have a flashlight, because you always need a flashlight. 
I have dominoes. So we set up dominoes um, in every place we go because they can, this is a, a good tool to use that they can, we can ask them to knock things over and they're loud enough if you set them on a wood surface that you can hear them go down. Even if it's not on a wood surface when they clink together, we set them up like a, um, you know how like you set them up like this and you push one. So we do that. And then, oh, this is a temperature gauge. Um, they say that when spirits are there, temperature lowers, which is true. I've, well, for me, it's true. I've done that before, so I have a temperature gauge. Um, we use a ball. This just really, put the ball down, move the ball. Easy little things. I have been given these. These are like, crystally rock things. I'm not into crystals. Some people are, um, but these, I'm supposed to put them outside, it charges them, and then it keeps me safe. So I do that once in a while. I don't really believe it, but somebody else believes it for me, so I do them, and I always have these little crystals in my thing. The other thing we do, uh, if you've heard of sage, people, you know, light the sage, and, and it helps keep out um, negative energy. Well, there are people, two girls on our team that are, they have allergies and so they won't, they don't like the sage that we burn. So I have sage spray. So it's a little, you know, different, but I have my sage spray. Uh, I do have dowsing rods. I hardly ever use them. Ghosts are supposed to be able to man manipulate them. I got them because they're cute and pink, but I don't ever use them, but they're in my bag just, you know. In case someone goes, hey, get out the dowsing rods. Um, I always have a notebook because sometimes I write things down so that I have what's going on in my head. And then if somebody says, oh, you know, mentions something, I go, oh, I wrote that down. So that we know that we're, we're on the same page with things. Um, this is my main big bag that I take. And there's just, you know. Some little things, we, we used to go uh, out with a guy who would make us all these little name tags. And so I have all these name tags of all these different places. We had to go, it was very formal, we had to wear these. So I, I, I have like a, a little array of different places I've been. Um, I th so I think that's it. I mean, the Paranormal Housewives are here to stay. We are still a team. We, lots of teams come and go. My original team, SESPR, they're no longer. Um, a lot of teams fall apart. And my team is awesome. And we still love each other. We call each other our parasisters because that's what we are. And even though we're not related, um, that's, that's what we are. Can we do questions and answers? Thanks so much for sharing. Uh, so what did, I was curious to know what your mom reacted when you first shared with her your experiences. And uh, just question number two, sorry, is um, did you, everything is real positive, which is nice, but did you have any, is everything always positive? Do you, did you ever feel threatened? Okay, first question. What did my mom think when I talked to her? So I actually didn't talk to my mom about it. Uh, she, well, she knew that I was into ghosts and things, but I actually, and she was very positive about it. She never said, oh, that's weird, oh, that's wrong. Um, but what did happen was when I was at, I was about in my early 20s, I was at her house and we were talking about something and she looked at me and she says, is there a ghost here? And I'd never told her about William. She only, I think she knew, but we always talked about my imaginary friends. She says, is there a ghost here? And I said, do you wanna know? And she goes, well, yes. And I said, yes. And I said, William is here. And he's like, she's like, okay. So, and she said, she started telling me some of the experiences she was having. So that night she actually went around and like locked all the doors and shut all the windows. I'm like, mom, <laughs> it's, he lives here, first of all. Second of all, he's a ghost. He doesn't, you know, he can go through walls. It doesn't, <laughs> anyway, she was a little freaked out, but she had had experiences herself. So she was always, never, ever once told me ghosts aren't real. She was always very like, okay, all right, that's fine. 
It's good. And then the second question about negative. 95, I would say 95% of what we come across is good. And not necessarily good. We have come across cranky spirits, uh, ghosts that are just pissed off. I had one one time at my house. I would do the, I put my laundry in, I shut the thing, I went away, came back to switch my loads. The door was up so it hadn't run. And I was like, dang it. I pushed it down, went away, came back, it was up again. And I pushed it down and I was like, I'm shutting the door because so I could remember that I shut the door, went away, came back, was up again. It was this cranky old man that didn't want me doing laundry in, in his house. It wasn't William. It was actually a house that I lived in with my husband, our first condo. But so um, the other 5% is negative and there are negative things, not all the time. Um, we don't deal with negative things because we have children and there's a team that we have that we call if we ever feel anything negative um, and we call them. There's actually one uh, house in Laguna uh, Hills, actually, um, that the gentleman had a not good thing there. And we, ha we brought in this other team. I saw a lot of weird, crazy stuff. Um, but yeah, so most of the stuff is just people. All it is is just people without bodies most of the time. So thank you for your question. For somebody who hasn't spoken before, you're an excellent speaker. I just <laughs> wanted to you. say that. Thank um, you. But I wanted to ask a question. You sure. referenced um, some intergalactic experiences. Yes. I don't call them aliens. Um, and for a feeling, for a person who isn't from around here, so to speak, I was just kind of interested in what those were for you and how you... Um, experience them. sure so my first ex well actually my first experience i didn't know it was an experience till later on in life but my first experience that i knew was a was an experience was i was at um winter camp i was in high school i was at winter camp for my church that i went to and it, we were standing outside and we saw in the sky this red it looked like a mushroom to me this red mushroom in the sky and it was kind of big um, and I was like, what is that? It was nighttime. What is that? It was weird. And then it would move. And then it went up like this real fast, which was weird. And then it went behind this tree. And then it, we, it like sped off where it, we couldn't, you couldn't track it with your f head. We freaked out. We ran into our cabin and, of course, hid underneath our sleeping bags because that'll help. Um, but that was my first ever, what I thought was my first encounter. My my. What I now know is my first encounter. My sister, and she's going to hate me for telling you guys this, she, and she doesn't think it's true, I believe she was abducted by aliens. And I say this because this happened twice. Um, I woke up, we shared a room in my childhood home. I woke up and in our bedroom, there was a window at the base of my bed. And I saw her woke one night in the middle of the night looking out the window, had her hands on the windowsill, it was up, it was one of these kind of windows. And I said, Carrie, her name's Carrie. I said, Carrie, Carrie, she wasn't listening. She was just staring out the window. And I leaned back, because I was like, oh, she's not listening. And I go up, I said, Carrie, she's not there at the window. I look in the bed, she's not there in the bed. I was like, so I thought, okay, I'm dreaming. I lay back down and I'm like, I gotta be dreaming. And I look again, she's in the bed. That scenario happened twice within, I would say six months of each other. Didn't think anything of it until later on in life, my sister cannot remember any of her childhood. She doesn't remember reading me reading to her every single night. She doesn't remember some of the things we did. She doesn't remember William. She doesn't remember a lot of her stuff. She also can't have kids. So there's just a lot of things. And anytime I talk about it, so one of the things with me, if I'm talking about something that's on the right path, I get chills. And so every time I talk about that, I get a lot of chills. So those are actually my two alien encounters that I know of. And maybe these white things at Amargosa, we don't know. They might be my earth angels. When my then husband and I visited Prescott, Arizona, um, we stayed at the Vendome Hotel. Okay. And room 16 is haunted. Okay. And um, anyway, I, I said, I want to go get a Ouija board. Let's go to Kmart. And so we got one, and what it spelled out was go home. <laughs> 
But one, one other quick thing about that is that I was tell when I was back in North Dakota, um, I was telling my dad, North Dakota farmer, who was not usually into the ooh stuff. Yeah. Anyway, I was telling him this, and I expected him to ridicule it in some way. But instead, he said, well, you know, I woke up one time, and I was sitting on my bed, and I saw this little lady walking, and she had a hat on. I think it might have been my mother, yeah. you know, your grandmother. So I was really surprised at that, too. See, and that's the thing. The people that have experiences are the ones that will believe. And it's not so if people don't believe, it's OK. Like, I'm OK. If you don't believe, if you're a skeptic, that's fine. You just haven't had an experience yet to where you really, you know, that you really can believe. So thank you for your question. Are we desensitizing you to Yes, um, I actually seniors? really enjoyed this. Yes. And you all are very lovely old people. Yes. yes. <laughs> but I'll be there soon. Don't be afraid. <laughs> No, You're not old. That's we, we're right. We're seasoned, yeah. We've been walking around the planet. So I have a question about um, earth energy. Okay. I lived on an island in the northwest, and I remember my sadness when, when the wildness wasn't wild anymore. It was yep. my backyard. But there were parts of the forest that I was mushrooming, and I found this one patch, but I realized I shouldn't have been in that neck of the woods. Yeah. I had another experience where I was... Well, it's, it's very dark, and I, it was winter, and I realized I was very far from home, and it was going to get really, really dark. And I thought, oh, shoot, you need to get back. So I was running. I was, I was worried because there was no trail, and I could hurt myself. And energy started coming out of the woods that wanted me. And it wasn't frightening, but they wanted me. It was right. like elementals. Yep. Is that sort of the same so yeah, there's territory. There yeah. is, I believe in elementals. I've had encounters with elementals. Elementals is basically um, nature or fairies or gnomes or any of those type of things. Um, I do believe that any living thing has energy. That's, I mean, that's scientifically proven that any living thing has energy. And so whether the the trees or the grass is energy is different than people energy, but it definitely has um, that kind of stuff in it. I believe that they want to interact with us. Oh, yeah. I and that's why that is 100 percent why plants thrive yeah. when you talk to them. I think there's a longing. Oh, that's, yeah. That's what I got. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a four year old granddaughter and she has several times talked about her other mother, the mother she had before. But she does other things like that. She tells me, she, even when she was two and three, what to do or don't park here or this or that. And I always thought, oh, baloney. But she's usually right. She said, yep. take the turkey out of the oven, it's done. And said, no, it is not done. <laughs> and it got burned. <laughs> so, I mean, she's just amazing, but, but she does, she doesn't elaborate on the other mother. She just casually says, I, I had another mother. She sounds like an old soul. And I do believe that depending on, because that, I believe in reincarnation that you keep coming back until you're done, you've done what you're supposed to yeah. do. And so a lot of people have come back several times, a lot of times, and I call them old souls. My, my daughter is an old soul. I, when she was three years old, um, she told me, she says, what's that? I was washing my face and putting moisturizer on. I said, oh, it's moisturizer. And she goes, no, no, that looks like cold cream. I'm like, my grandmother said cold cream. I, that's not even a word. And so I, I do believe in old souls and your granddaughter is an old soul. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Thank you very much uh, for coming. Thank this you. This has been very interesting. Uh, I have uh, always been fascinated with the idea of ghosts, shadows, that kind of from the time I was small, but I was a little frightened of them. And I was told that uh, if you have a visitation, if you ask them to leave, they yes. will leave. Yes. Okay. And I did have a visitation uh, as an adult uh, from an I, I would say from an intergalactic okay. source. I, I and um, I was frightened. I, I, kind of stared at them and look, and then I told them I was, you know, uncomfortable and asked them to leave, and they did. Yeah. And they have never been back. 
And I, I've always often wondered if I would invite them back. If well, people do invite come. people them back. Right. So yes. Oh. But also, um, most spirits or ghosts, aliens are different or intergalactic beings. Mm -hmm. They have their own. They're their their people mm -hmm. or whatever they are, but spirits um, are people just like us. So if you walked into someone's house mm -hmm. and they asked you to leave, would you leave? I would leave, Absolutely. you know? So that's a lot of spirits. If you ask them to leave, they'll leave. Yeah, well, this one did. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and I, I also wanted to uh, say that I also believe in reincarnation. Yeah. And have been here, I'm certain, many times. Yeah, me too. When we die, don't we go to heaven? So or, some people believe in that. Or have you ever had a spirit tell you, if you've ever asked, why are you here? Why don't you go to heaven? Why, are you, why do you stay here? So um, in my uh, research, I guess you could call it, there's three things why they stay. The first reason why they stay is that they don't know they're dead. They've had some tragic... Uh, ending of their life and they don't realize that they're dead and they just keep going about their life. That's one of the reasons why they, why I feel they stay. Second reason is they've, uh, they've not finished what they need to finish or uh, uh, they have information that they have to get out. And so they find people like me to try to get their information to like, hey, I need to finish this before I can move on to wherever I need to move on. And the third one for me is that they're scared of moving on. They've maybe done something that they know is not good in their life and they just stay around and they stick around because they're scared of what comes next. And for me, I I am not I don't necessarily know if I would call it heaven. It's because heaven is so has a religious connotation to it. I just for me personally, I feel like you just you're here and you keep coming back until your purpose what you your purpose is, is fulfilled. And it could take however many lifetimes it could take to do whatever you're supposed to do. And then you move on to heaven. So, But those are the three main reasons why I think spirits are here. While you were telling stories about your personal experience and then the group, um, I thought it was interesting. So a group like uh, Zach and yep. the, other, the other folks, which I don't care for very much. Um, <laughs> Uh, so no one needs to have paranormal experiences. That threw me. I thought that they needed that component to validate. Um, so are you talking about it just in the TV world or any No, world? no, the real stuff. No, so I, I know people that investigate and they've never had an experience. Um, you, don't, you, can, you can go into your house right now and talk to whatever spirit is there, put on a recorder or a kid, a K2 meter, which you can find on Amazon and do it yourself and talk to whoever is there. You don't have to have experience. I'm sorry for the discussion. Is That's okay. Question thing. Um, but isn't, isn't the reception of, to be receptive to um, the people around you that are uh, um, spirits around you, um, don't you have to have some sort of sense uh, sensitivity to so, it in uh, order to get evoke someone responding to you and whatever you want to do? No. Um, everybody here, I feel, has that sensitivity. And it's just whether you have suppressed it long enough or not. So as a child, it was never suppressed for me, ever. I was never told ghosts aren't real. I was never told to, oh, that can't happen. That's, you know, I was never told that. So I've just, it's a muscle. I've always used this muscle. Everybody has this muscle, in my opinion. And so like, for example, Kirsten, when she first joined, when we all did, first did Paramount Housewives, she was like, oh, I have no sensitivities. I have nothing. I, I won't get anything. As she has used her sensitivity and her, her muscle, she now gets stuff. She feels stuff. She feels stuff I feel. Her and I a lot connect with the same person that's in the house. She'll get the same pictures I get. And it's just a muscle. So anybody, personally I feel, 
you can go out and do this. It's just a muscle that has been suppressed for people and not for others. I was wondering what you know about past life regression uh, and if you have ever thought about doing that. So there, past life regression is a thing. I've actually never experienced it before. I have myself had dreams of my past life, but I've never actually gone to someone that has done past life regression. I completely think it's a thing. Do you know of one? I do not know of anyone, actually, mm -hmm. that does past life regression. I've never even thought about it because I, always, I already know that I've had past lives. And so, you don't know what you were. You uh, know. I, I know one. I was a teacher. Her name was Susan. I had a husband and two kids. And I got in a um, like a, a horse-drawn carriage accident, and I died. I know of that one. That's just because I've dreamed of her a lot. But other than that, I'm not, I, I, I've never had any interest, I think, because I already know. But I don't know who, exactly who they are. Mm -hmm. I do think I was on the Titanic. You do? Yes, because I went to the Titanic exhibit, and I got so overwhelmed with emotion in the Titanic exhibit. Like, I just felt it was weird. I felt like I was home. Um, I got, like, the, there was, like, the, this room where they had, like, a fake iceberg. I felt scared. I mean, the, the feelings that I got in the Titanic exhibit... I thought, oh, I, maybe I was on the Titanic. So I think I was on the Titanic. It's a terrifying thought to think of being on there. Yes, yes. Um, but I know I'm going to come back and keep oh. going, do something else. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, it's nice to have you here. Thank You've you. You've done a great job. Um, I wanted to find out, you said that you and your investigators go to, in, to people's homes or whatnot to investigate. Yes and help them. Yes. So I was wondering what you do to help them. So um, when we have people come to us, they come to us through, either through Facebook, because we have a Facebook page or our website, and they say, okay, something's going on in our house. We'll come to their house. Uh, we'll first walk their home just to check. We check things like regular things like plumbing or electrical issues, because one thing with electrical issues is that if you um, have a lot of uh, free roaming electricity, like it's, it's, called, it's, we, it's called a Faraday cage or something with a lot of electricity all around, it can actually put, make you feel things, see things, hear things with all this extra electricity. So we make sure there's no like electrical leaks or anything in your house. Not that we're professionals, but we do have our equipment that we can check all this stuff. And then, they tell us what, they're been ex what they've been experiencing. And then we go in and we try to get evidence for that. We try to get EVPs, like I was talking about earlier. So we'll ask specific questions. Um, and sometimes the people that the homeowner wants us to talk to aren't there. Like this one, one home we did, we, this woman had lost her son. And she wanted us to talk to her son. Her son was not there. But we did end up talking to this other gentleman that was there. Um, and we just, we try to make them comfortable with either having the spirit in their home or we empower them to say, hey, this is your house. You just tell them to leave. And most of the time, spirits will leave if it's just a regular normal spirit. If it's not a regular normal spirit, we contact our other team. <laughs> so we... We try to make them feel comfortable. And then after the investigation, we're always there. All, one of the five of us, we give them our numbers. They can call us anytime they want. If something happens, we can go back out, whatever. We're like a, a lifeline, I guess. Because of TV and movies, uh, it was driving this question. So we all, we, most of us know about that New Jersey lady who uh, uh, can talk to people about that someone's deceased. Yeah. And, and she mentions that she's constantly bombarded wherever yeah. she goes. It sounds like she may not have the same protection you. She do, well, she doesn't, I put a shield up. She doesn't put a shield up. Okay. Okay. I'm sure she can, but. Oh, oh, really? I'm sure she can. Most of us, we always do some sort of protection when we go into any investigation. Um, my shield is just, I put a bigger shield on when I'm out regular because I don't want to be 
bombarded or talked to or anything. But I'm sure she could. But she makes money doing that, so she doesn't want to put a shield up. <laughs> what do you think about Ouija boards? I know, I, I know the experience I've had. Um, nothing, nothing terrible, but some. I, I had my granddaughters doing it, and I asked the questions, and the Ouija board answered in the way they could never ever have known. So we don't like Ouija boards. Um, we don't use them. We don't. Tell, we tell our homeowners that we go to. We tell them not to use them because Ouija boards open up we feel a portal to something that you don't know what's going to come through right and if they don't know how to use it properly they don't close it out properly they don't close the the hole that they've created the opening um we who knows what could come in and out so i we are not ouija board people we don't use them and they're, they work, which is the funniest thing. But it's a board game by Milton Bradley. But scary. it's a little scary for us, too. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to add something that's been my experience since I work with the dying. Um, and also, I've had my experiences. Is to ask permission and to apologize if I made a mistake and the energy in which I come, which is in the spirit of love. Yep. That everything in the spirit of love is welcomed, and the other is you know, not welcome. But there's, there's a sense of respect. Yeah. And because of the, what's happening in our world, I think that's needed among ourselves yeah. more than anything, is that we respect and honor one another, that each one of us is a spark of the divine, right. whether we agree with them or not. Yes. So thank you. Yeah, we actually have, actually, let me see if I have it in here. Here it is. So we say at the beginning and at the end of every, we have, it's been used a lot. So here, I'm gonna read to you what we say at the beginning of investigations and at the end. So at the beginning we say, we ask your permission to enter and we seek communication with the positive energies inhabiting this dwelling. We wish to know who you are and to understand why you are here. We will respect and listen to your wishes and ask that you do the same for us. We also ask that if you desire to, to communicate with us through our senses, including our psychic abilities, that you do so without inflicting physical, emotional, or spiritual harm. We have also brought equipment, which you can use to imprint your voice on tape, except it's not a tape anymore, and we will open, be open to such displays. We will assist anyone who occupies this dwelling for the greater good of all concerned. So that's what we say. We say that, and then we also usually do a prayer circle because there's a couple of our, of girls, of our girls that do want to pray. And then at the end, we always do this closing statement because you have to close it up to, to be finished. So at the clo our closing statement is, at this time, we would like to thank the spirits and energies who, who have communicated with us and allowed us to access this place in peace and harmony. Remember, you can leave here at any time by asking your, for your spirit guides to come for you, or you may stay as, you're, as you are. It is your choice. As we respect your right to be where you want to be, we ask that you respect us by not attaching your energy to our energy fields, nor attempt to... Uh, accompany us as we leave this place. Our intention was to learn to communicate and to harm no one. We thank you for your help and patience in our research and bid you farewell as we leave this place. So this is what we say, beginning, end of all of our things, because that is one thing that our team does is that we do come in love and light and we don't want to provoke and we don't you know, want to cause harm or anything. We just want to talk to them and learn from them and help the homeowner if they need help. So that's what we do. So when you encounter a situation where you have a not good spirit, how, how does that sense that for you? Is it a feeling or does something happen? Can you kind of elaborate on that? So, okay, the... The, okay, for example, the, the one that was here in Laguna Hills, um, we, in, we, went to, we went on this investigation. It was a man at his house. And when I get senses, I get pictures in my head, I feel the energies of the spirits, and I can usually get like a, a story about what's going on, who's there. 
This one was so weird and random. Like I was getting weird, random pictures. My thoughts were like all over the place. It was really jumbled. I'd never experienced anything like that before. There were these little red dot lights, like sparkly, like we call them Tinkerbell lights because that's they look like little Tinkerbell, but they were red. It was weird. And the, the homeowner said he would hear three knocks on his door. He would open up the door, nobody was there. So all of these little things, I was like, well, this is so weird. And Kirsten actually was the one she was recording. All of her recordings were erased, all of them that were in this house. And at the end of this investigation, we, when we come to the end, we say our thing, we go out into where our cars are parked, and we talk about it. And Kirsten's like, something is not right here. And I'm like... Yeah, but it's weird because it was all jumbly in, in my sense. We keep, we keep, I kept seeing those little red lights. And Kirsten says, I, need, I think we need to call Dave and Tom and his, their team. And I said, okay, well, I didn't feel, the thing is, and this actually scared me a little bit, I didn't feel like it was bad. I just felt confused. And that's what negative, the negative entities do is confusion. And so we called them in. I actually went with them on their investigation and it was it was scary. But they ended up getting rid of what was in the house. They did all their saging and over all the windows and the entrances and they in California we have a very um, big Native American spiritual population here. And so we um, if there's negative energy, we ask that the Native American spirits help out protecting the house. So we offer them, we, we made them have, we told the homeowner to have like a little offering of tobacco, coffee, um, little that type of stuff in like on his balcony area, just as like, and then, then to say, here's some, you know, for you to help protect my house. Because Native American spirits are very powerful and they're very good, most of them, and they can help out a lot. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you.